water drilling 150 holes back into the rock and blasting it out with explosives. They had these moles, and you just moved this machine up to the face of the rock and just ate away at it. And it took no time at all to intercept the uh, spillway tunnels. So we're looking out of the newly made tunnel, looking into where it is broken into the, one of the spillway tunnels. This hole is going to be enlarged. Uh, the lake's going to be drained. Temporary fill is going to be put in there, and then trucks are going to be driven in, and they are going to go upstream again, working on the repairs. So just once again, here is the damage section right in here, right in here, the damage sections of the spillway tunnels. Here are the two new access tunnels going into the spillways. And the pictures I'll be showing you next are coming from just upstream of those uh, repair access tunnels. Here they are paving uh, one, of the one of the new uh, access tunnels. Uh, upstream, they also started making changes to the entrances to the spillways. They had to have some way to stop the cavitation from ever happening again. So what we're looking at here are the back sides of those two big gates, those 52 and a half foot gates that keep water from going directly into the tunnel under normal lake levels. These are the temporary eight foot high flashboards that were put in during the emergency trying to keep so much water from going down into those tunnels. Now initially these were just four foot high pieces of plywood holding back the upper four feet of Lake Powell. It was so important to keep as much water out of those tunnels as possible that they used plywood initially. Eventually, they fabricated these steel uh, flashboards. Uh, they were put in, I think, in July of 1983, but later on they were removed because it was realized that they were actually illegal, that uh, Glen Canyon Dam didn't have authorization to flood another eight feet of the reservation, for instance, or any other uh, section upstream. But there's more work going on down here, downstream of these gates. And what was being done was that they're going to blast out a section of the concrete lining and enlarge the tunnel diameter uh, only by a few feet, for a few feet. So it's only going to be four foot slot that goes all the way around or almost all the way around the circumference of the tunnel. The water is going to have to jump over that slot. This is going to introduce a lot of bubbles into the water and that will keep the cavitation problem from reappearing. In 1984, this was tested and it turned out to work great. They ran high flows for five days in the summer of 84 after the repair work had been done and there was no evidence of cavitation. But what a mess. This is taking place in a tunnel. Water is pouring out of the concrete because the lake is up above this level. It's in the dark and they're blasting out concrete. This is much more difficult work than the original work of drilling the tunnel and placing the concrete. They're going to have to blast away the concrete that's already been put in. All that concrete out and then uh, put in, build uh, forms to put in these slots. This pipe is uh, pushing concrete into the uh, pore area. So it's right in here that they're enlarging the diameter of the tunnel. And remember, all it is is a spot that's just a few feet wider than the rest of the tunnel, and the water's going to jump over that slot and pick up a lot of air on the way. And here's the almost completed slot. Kind of a surprisingly easy fix for a really bad problem. But you can see how everyone's dressed in raincoats working in the dark here. I mean, this has got to be a pretty interesting or miserable job. I'm not sure which. And then down at the bottom, at the elbows, where all of the major damage occurred, they're tearing out the broken concrete, uh, sawing off and torching off the rebar, and starting to replace the whole mess.
And all of this work was done in less than a year. So this is on the inside of the uh, flat section of tunnel. The form that was used for pouring the concrete, this form could actually be blown up, expanded uh, to fill the right size. And then um, after the concrete had hardened, then uh, shrink its size and pull it downstream a little bit. I think I've done something here. Want to look at this picture for a while? <laughs> uh, there were drains that were put into the ceiling of the tunnel initially so that pressure would not build up uh, above the tunnel. And these drains were carrying a lot of water, so they were really in the way. And they tried to divert those by using these plastic tubes into a trough that was hanging along the slide, the side, just to get that water out of the way. And this is the doorway that you can walk to, um, if you have permission, uh, from the, uh, the access tunnels, the emergency access tunnels, into the diversion tunnels, and I was surprised to just find out that it's a relatively thin steel door, uh, but it actually sits up above the floor of the spillway, or, you know, the spillway tunnels, so uh, water never actually tries to get in these doors. And this is what the entrance to those emergency access tunnels looks like today. And if you walk in that door, you walk down through this uh, sloping floor, and there's the door at the end that leads directly into the spillway tunnels. And this actually turns out to be kind of a nice feature. There was no easy way to get into the old spillway tunnels, and now there's an easy way to get in there just to see what's going on. The dam as it looks today, and then inside, uh, those gates at the top, um, these are the gates that uh, where uh, last spring actually high and dry, but the lake is now up on these again, and uh, it's about to drop below it. Right now, the inflows in the Lake Powell are about the same as the outflows. The lake is not coming up very much, which is very unusual for May, but that just reflects the fact that the snowpack in the Rockies has been very poor. And here, one of the uh, galleries that allow you to walk from one end of the dam to the other. Uh, four different levels, five different galleries, uh, plus others that run from front to back of the dam. And almost all of them have these drainage channels next to them. Uh, these uh, are to carry any water that leaks into the dam and try to get it into the drainage channels and out of the dam as quickly as possible. They don't want water building up pressure. Uh, underneath the dam primarily, or on the upstream side. Uh, there are something like 1,500 different types of gauges embedded in the concrete of Glen Canyon Dam. These are temperature gauges and stress and strain gauges. Uh, those are all electrical in nature, and you can plug in the panels and read what they're, what's going on inside the dam from these 1,500 uh, sensors. But in addition to that, there's also a fail-safe system that's a plumb bob. Four, I think maybe five plumb bobs that run from the top of the dam down to the bottom. So these stainless steel wires run from the very top of the dam almost to the very bottom. They've got 26 foot or 26 pound weights on them uh, that are dampened by sitting in a, a, a barrel of oil. And by using these devices, you can measure whether the dam is leaning downstream, which is kind of important, they seem to think, <laughs> or leaning any direction. Uh, so if all of the other devices, the uh, theodolites that they use on the face of the dam downstream, the 1,500 sensors that are embedded in the concrete, if all of these things fail, you can just go to this plumb bob and get some idea of what's going on. 
When you uh, go through the dam on a regular tour, you go down an elevator, and that elevator takes you to a chamber that goes out to a walkway and over to the power plant. Uh, but if you go on down deeper in the dam, uh, there are no elevators, so you just go down spiral staircases initially, and then later on sloping uh, staircases like this. Stalactites a little bit. Uh, by the way, this is Dwayne Barrier, uh, who is an electrician at the dam that retired a long time ago, but he's one of the major uh, people that takes people on tours today. Been at the dam for a long time. This is at the intersection of where the dam meets the rock of Glen Canyon. So we're looking out of Glen Canyon Rock into the dam, and there are three or four of these uh, tunnels on each side of the dam. And here is one of those measuring devices that will tell them how much the rock is being compressed by the force of the reservoir on the dam. And this is the lowest most of those tunnels, and you can see it's the wettest also. I want to go in there with an umbrella and a raincoat. There are also vertical uh, ladders that go up and down some sections of the dam. This goes down to a place where you can inspect the penstocks that go through the dam, headed for the turbines. And then this is as low as you can go. Uh, we're only 40 feet above the base of the dam, or about 100 feet below river level. And the farther down, down the dam you go, the wetter it is, and the noisier it is because of all the water running towards this point. And water from here uh, goes down into a sump pump, and it's pumped up uh, to what appears to be the base of the dam when you're standing at that and looking at the grassy field. So the water is pumped up over 100 feet here up to the grassy field and goes into a catch basin. And you might have noticed that catch basin that runs along the base of the Kirby Dam. There it is, the catch basin on the right. You can even see a little water coming out of a 30-inch pipe there.